You know, it's quite marvellous that we have so many different ways to consume stories. We can read a printed book, we can listen to an audio book, we can read a book on so many different electronic devices. I have been on the cusp of buying a e-reader or a Kindle for a, couple, a few years now and the new colour Kindle that's just come out may have tipped me over the edge if I hadn't seen this recent YouTube video about ebooks. And it kind of prompted this real long internal discussion that I had about how we read books, how we consume books, and it really started this internal dialogue that I wanted to bring you on the journey of and invite you into this discussion. So in this video, we're going to have a really nerdy bookish chat about these three main forms of reading, which includes printed books, eBooks, and audiobooks. I'm gonna share a few of my current reads on these formats. I'm going to share why I've decided not to buy a Kindle anytime soon. And at the very end, I'm gonna share my philosophy on reading moving ahead because this has really become such a cathartic experience for me to really assess how I read books, why I read books. And anyway, we'll get into that at the end. I know many of you have a preferred method of being a ebook reader or an, an audiobook reader, and there is a variety of reasons why I get that. These are just based on my needs and my own ethics, I guess. And I'm definitely not saying that one method is better than any other. I'm just going to kind of share with you what my preferred method of reading is and why that is and it's going to be based on my needs at this moment in time I am never someone to say never things change there are reasons for that always and there's always a reason why you might have a preferred method at this moment in time so I hope there is something interesting in here for you I hope this is an interesting discussion it's definitely something that's been interesting to me and maybe it will make you rethink how you consume stories and books in the future so settle in grab a bevy and let's first of all let's chat about ebooks which is what kicked off this entire conversation internally for me so a few weekends ago I stumbled across a video from Jared Henderson and it was about Kindle and Amazon and so in, in 2009 Amazon just removed George Orwell's 1984 from their bookshelves so if you had purchased the book it was it disappeared from your shelves on your Kindle it was not available for purchase and the reason behind this which at first I thought that maybe it was to do with banned books but it actually turned out that the the publisher didn't have the rights or the license to publish the book. So Amazon's, their solution to this was just to remove the book entirely. And so people who had paid for the book, just it just vanished from their bookshelves. I do highly recommend watching the video from Jared, which is linked below, but he will go into it much better than I ever could, much more succinctly. Uh, but for me, what I got from this video was it led into a larger discussion about the wider digital space. He spoke about how this discovery for him led into a bigger a d bigger investigation into the terms of Amazon and the their ebooks and what that means for you as a consumer, which I found really, really interesting, especially in the wider digital space, not just with Amazon. So in short, when you're purchasing things in a digital space, you are generally licensing something. You are not purchasing it outright. When I use music on this channel, I am not purchasing the music. I am purchasing a license to use it for a definite amount of time. And that's the same with ebooks. 
Amazon was allowing people to purchase a license for that book. It was not like you would buy a book in a bookstore and that book was your own to do with as you wanted. You had a license for that book and you could only use it within the parameters of that licensing agreement that Amazon would have with their own providers, knowing that they removed 1984, which the irony, the irony that they removed 1984 by George Orwell off their shelves was not lost on me. But it kind of led into the conversation about how a lot of books recently are being edited to fit today's standards. You know, you think about Roald Dahl's books and his books are being seen as very problematic for children and so they are being edited. And I have a number of Roald Dahl's books on my bookshelf, but if I had had an ebook. That book very well may have been edited to today's standards and removed certain passages that were not in the original edition. So Amazon in particular have the ability to edit and change. Their terms say that they can edit and change the content at any time. So they can change the cover of uh, books. So what book you may purchase at one point in time, the, the cover may be updated to something new. Maybe there's a Netflix movie coming out and they update it to the new you know, cover with the actors on the front of it. Or there is that situation where the book has been changed because of some censorship and so then you're stuck with that edition. And as a side note, I saw this recently with a TV series where Netflix decided, so Netflix recently had the license to stream Mad Men. In Australia, I don't know if this happened in America as well, but in Australia, they decided to remove one episode entirely. What they decided to do was it was an episode where one particular character dresses in blackface. And rather than allow the audience to make a decision about the character's behavior and to allow the scene to unfold and the episode, which the episode itself, if you're a Mad Men fan, I think it might be called My Old Kentucky Home, is very, it's a pivotal, it's a pivotal episode for so many characters. And Netflix deciding to just remove the entire episode left a huge gap. So if you weren't familiar with the TV show, it didn't wouldn't have made much sense because new characters were introduced. There was major pivotal moments. Anyway, Netflix decided to just remove it rather than allow viewers to make their own decision about the character's behavior. That was something else that I've seen. So that's something that we're starting to see happening in books and now in TV shows where streamers are starting to make these decisions for us. Anyway, that's a bit of a side note, but it's still consumership and I, I think it's still quite relevant. I mean, even The Jungle Book and Peter Pan are two movies, cartoons, that have very problematic uh, depictions of people, but they haven't edited the content. They have a very big disclaimer at the start that you cannot skip you cannot uh you can't jump through it you have to you have to view that and it tells you it, it says that they understand that this informate that this uh depiction is wrong they understand that now and rather than remove it they want to create a dialogue around it and i think that is a much better way to approach it and that's my personal opinion yeah, anyway, so I don't know why. Netflix, it was such a baffling decision, in my opinion, and I hate to see it happening in the publishing world where books are just being edited, but I digress. Rant over. So in terms of ebooks and Amazon, I found it really fascinating that the terms state that we are licensing these books, that we do not own them, that at any time Amazon can edit and change or remove them entirely from the bookshelf. That I found interesting because I have bought ebooks in the past. And the reason that I would buy ebooks generally at the time would, would be because I could not buy them in Australia. So, for example, I, I loved Martha Stewart magazines and it was impossible to find them in Australia. And at some point they had a digital subscription. So I would have the digital subscription to Martha Stewart. And there would be some books that I would buy that would be harder to get in Australia. Shipping rates were impossible to deal with in Australia. So I would sometimes buy books that way. Or maybe it was a book that I just did not want to go into a store and purchase in person. So I would do that on, on 
Kindle. I don't, I have not used an ebook for a long, 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 long time. But that said, there are so many times where people have said that they have been locked out of their Amazon account for a variety of reasons. And if you're locked out of your account, you will lose your entire access to that library. So maybe you've done something that Amazon has deemed that it is a violation of their terms and they could suspend your account and then you've lost your entire library with them. That I find quite confronting because of the amount of money you might have invested and if that's your preferred method of reading you could lose your entire Kindle library. And while this conversation is kind of specific to Amazon I have heard of similar issues with Apple books or ebook purchases. You know you may have bought a book when you lived in Canada and then you've moved to Europe and that book is not licensed in Europe so then you've lost that you'd lost the ability to access that book. That sort of stuff is quite, you don't realize it until it happens. Anyway, it's maybe not a big deal. I find it interesting that you don't own the book like you do a physical book. And I think there is a mental hurdle you have to get over at first with that, because when you purchase a book, it feels like, like you just the language of saying that you're buying a book, you're buying a book. You don't say you're going to license a book on Kindle. You're going to buy a book on Kindle. I see the benefits of ebooks. I get that they are very, they're quick to get hold of. I love that idea. They are cheaper. I really, I appreciate that. I appreciate they are much cheaper. The Amazon Prime account that I have, there's a number of Kindle books that are free within that Prime membership. And they really, they are environmentally friendly, although I do guess you, you have to use electricity. So there is that element to it. You also do have to update your tech eventually. Like I said, I used to have ebooks and I used an iPad with a Kindle app. I I do have the iPad still. Officially now, probably would not be able to watch or read any of those books on that device. So I would have to update my technology to be able to access those books. But yeah, the biggest the biggest hurdle for me in terms of ebooks would be that I do not own I do not own any of the books that I purchase when it comes to an ebook. So let's move on to audiobooks. Similar to my comments on ebooks, I understand the life of the terms of agreement when you are purchasing an audiobook are similar to an ebook. When you look at the terms, the terms say that you have ability to access the items as long as Amazon have the license to distribute them. It's the same issue. It's a similar licensing structure. Personally, I love audiobooks. I think they are a great great option. They are a wonderful gateway into the world of reading. And they take me back to that feeling of being a child and being read to. I think there is that nostalgia of it. There's a there's an animation that comes with it, you know, hearing someone put emphasis on words. And generally when I listen to an ebook, I tend to listen to it when I am driving. I try not to multitask when I listen to an ebook uh, when I listen did I say ebook before? When I am listening to an audiobook, I tend I try not to multitask because I start to zone out. To me, it's defeating the purpose. I often I am listening to an audiobook for the first time, so I want to try and be, you know, purposeful in listening to it. I did used to have an Audible subscription a long time ago, so I do have a little catalogue of books over there, which sometimes I'll jump into here and there. But again, I've noticed sometimes the, I can't find the books that I had purchased with them, which is really annoying. So purchased, licensed. So now when I listen to audiobooks, I, I listen to them for free and I either listen to them on YouTube, which is a great option, especially if you love golden age crime like Arthur Conan Doyle or Agatha Christie. There are some wonderful, wonderful narrations available there and they give this real radio play kind of quality to them. So there are some great options on YouTube. I also have on my Spotify subscription, I get access to 15 hours of audiobooks. So I will listen to a book on there. But what I generally do is if I'm reading a book and that's my primary book, I might pick up a chapter or two when I am driving. If I'm driving for like more than half an hour somewhere, I might pick up that book on audio while I'm driving. And I find that that's just a good way to keep keep a bit of cadence with the book and sometimes that audio can help me get a bit more invested into the book. Not every book is available through Spotify. There are some that are kind of locked. You have to purchase it, which I can never figure out how to do it, but I, I don't buy that. 15 hours is more than enough for me. Some audiobooks I listened to recently that I would highly recommend on audio is uh, the Agatha Christie book by Lucy Worsley. I listened to this in part while reading it in print while I was 
uh, sanding and staining a couple of a wardrobe and a desk for our home. There was a couple of weekends where I would just be out there just doing these monotonous repetitive tasks and so I would be listening to that while I would be doing these staining and sanding projects that was great Lucy Worsley is so engaging it's very chatty and you feel like you're listening to someone just having a conversation with you and I, I really recommend her audio narration of the Agatha Christie biography another one that I listened to and dipped into while I was reading the print book was H for H's for Hawk by Helen MacDonald which I just read recently in fact, the audio book was so beautiful that I was torn between just listening to the audio book and not reading the print. But the print was so beautiful as well to be immersed in that world and just to imagine imagine it for myself. And so it was they were they were equally as beautiful. I I I really recommend the audio if you if you've been thinking about it. The audio book is sublime and it is narrated by Helen. It is just beautiful, really, really gorgeous. Another one I dipped into while I was doing that enormous project with the furniture was uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And it was I can't remember who it was narrated by, but I'll, I'll put a link up. And it was just really a lot of fun. The narration was really good, had a lot of interesting accents and you know, a changing cadence, dialects and stuff. So it was a lot of fun. And I've got a couple of nonfiction ones on the go. One of them is Ultra Processed ultra processed People. And that one is really good. It's Again, it's in a bit of a chatty tone. This is a book that it's kind of starts off a bit like the, uh, I think it's Alan Carr's How to Stop Smoking, where it says you should listen to this book, or sorry, you should read this book while you still smoke because eventually the information in it will make you want to stop smoking. And this book says the same thing. It's like, just keep eating your normal, you know, Western diet, have your bread, have your, you know, processed foods. And by the end of it, you will not want any of that. And it's really interesting so far to, to hear the, how much stuff is processed. So anyway, I'm enjoying that one. And another one I've got on the go is called A Well-Gardened Mind. And it's a new one that I've just started, but the narration is really, really delicate, very, very thoughtful. It is narrated by the author again. And there is it's a connection between gardening and mental health. And I'm finding it very interesting to read or to listen to. I have the book on order. It hasn't arrived yet and I couldn't wait to get into it. It was something I came across recently. So I decided to start listening to the book while I wait for the book to arrive in hard copy, which I hope will be here this weekend. But I think one of my absolute most favorite audiobooks is the Little House on the Prairie series. It's narrated by a woman named Cherry Jones and it is so much fun. She is so talented. There is little little uh, elements of Pa's fiddle throughout and she does so well with all of the different voices and it's I, I really really enjoy them so I have all of those over on Audible and now I think about it after talking about the ebooks and getting books getting changed and banned I should probably get hold of a Little House on the Prairie collection because I don't have a printed copy of it and that's probably one I should get because that might happen eventually. <laughs> that sort of stuff could get edited or banned. So, but I highly recommend that. It's incredible. I've only listened to it on audio. I haven't read the books, but beautiful, beautiful narration. I really enjoyed it. So like I said, I usually listen to a book while I'm uh, driving, but sometimes I might listen to it while I'm doing a repetitive task like ironing or knitting, something that's like a, a repetitive task like 30 minutes or longer where I am just doing something in one location. I have tried to listen to audiobooks when I'm out walking or on a train and I just don't like wearing, I don't like doing it when I'm out and about. I feel like it closes me off from the world so I try, I try not to listen to headphones when I'm out and about like that. It's almost like there's a wall between myself and the rest of the world and I know a lot of people do it deliberately. You put the headphones in so people don't talk to you um, but there are there are reasons why I try not to do that I know a lot of people listen to audiobooks because they are time poor and they are able to listen to audiobooks while they get in their workouts or they cook dinner or get ready for their day I just find it too much for my brain to handle in the morning I prefer it to be dead quiet so I'm just too overstimulated I think the other reason I love audiobooks is that they add emphasis to words that you didn't you may not have gotten in a print reading you know reading by yourself 
And that's probably something why a reread is often good because you may get different things on the second time around. Hearing someone read to you, they can bring a dramatic flair that you may not have been able to imagine. But the narrator is so important. I have stopped audiobooks because the narrator was in just absolutely insufferable. That is so important. And maybe an audiobook is not possible because you can't find the right narrator for the book. There's a there's a number of jigsaw pieces, right, when it comes to the right audiobook. I have a friend who also, she gets motion sick. So when she commutes to work, she can't look at her phone. She can't read on the, on the train. So she listens to an audiobook. And I totally get that. I think that's really a great option. And I know a lot of other people, maybe they physically cannot read. There's an, a variety of reasons why you may not be able to read a physical book. So audiobooks are a great option for so many reasons. Now, often the elephant in the room when it comes to audiobooks is the question, is listening to an audiobook reading? This happens a lot when I, I see people, especially in YouTube, they talk about reading and someone says that they've read an audiobook and then there's the comments go crazy. My take on this is no, of course not. In the strictest sense of the word, it is not reading. But my feeling is that we don't read a book to experience the act of reading a word, or at least I don't. I don't read to read. I read to consume, to receive, to get a story. And that's what we get when we listen. We're processing information just the same way as if we were reading it. I do compare listening to an audiobook similar to being read to as a child or reading to a child. If I read to my grandson, we are reading a book together. He's not going to say at the end of it that he read a book by himself, but we read it together. We we absorbed the story. We understood the story. He could read he could tell the story to someone else. And I think that's a important part of it. We've shared that experience together. I feel it's really semantics to say audiobooks aren't reading because at the end of the day, who cares? I know a lot of people physically cannot read, like read words on a page for a variety of reasons. And I would hate anyone to feel that they are not participating in this brilliant world of reading just for semantics. So I honestly, who cares? I bet when typewriters came out, diehard writers were like, that ain't writing. That's not writing. But now here we are, books being written by AI. So things change. And I really do think that reading is not so much about the act of reading a word. It is about consuming a story now. I think that's what it means. To, that's what it means to me. And audiobooks are part of that process. Being read to is part of that process. And to be honest, I really wish that I could, I really wish that we could bring back being read to, you know, in a community sense. I think that's a such an important part of reading is sharing, sharing the reading, sharing the stories. So my thoughts on audiobooks are that they are great. Maybe people are physically are not able to read a book for whatever reason. Maybe they are time poor or they physically cannot read it. They are great for adding emphasis to words, giving you a bit of a dramatic flair and adding imagination. And they make me think of a time when people used to sit around and in a community and listen to a story together and share that experience. And I really do. I really, I really love that. Sometimes I wish we did that more as a community. But the disadvantages of audiobooks is that you may not own them. Wearing headphones closes you off from the world around you. And the narrator is such an important part of the experience. They really are, that a narrator can make or break a book. Okay, our third category, which is printed books. I don't think that printed books will ever go out of style. I I mean, I don't think any of these books will go out of style. Any of these three forms will. But printed books, I think, are here to stay. And they are my preferred mode of reading. These are the nostalgia giving lifeblood of reading as a pastime, in my opinion. Every book has a different font, typeset, paperweight, cover, story, size, weight. There's so many elements that come together in a book. And I love when all of these things click and you get a book that just brings you so much joy for the perfect reading experience. And I thought I might've been in the minority that a physical book makes me so, so happy. But for anyone else out there, I found this little study on physical books and in particular on the smell of books, which I wanted to share with you. So I'm gonna read this for you. And scientists analyze the chemical co composition of old books and they found that the pages contain hints of vanilla as well as grassy notes. In this sense, taking a whiff of an old book is a little like the enjoyment one gets from smelling perfume or flowers. 
Studies have shown that books can make us happier, inspire us to travel and encourage us to make life-changing decisions. I really love that. I mean, I don't go around like sniffing books or whatever, but there is something comforting about a hard copy book that I just feel so comforted by. It is a little bit of a security blanket for me that I really love. I guess if you thought about the cons of books, it is probably the first and foremost is probably the environmental concern. But my take on that is that once the book is printed, the carbon footprint is set, the book is recyclable, it is uh, reusable, I can share it, I can buy secondhand books there is I, I feel like it is much more renewable in that sense than maybe even ebooks you know the price of books have certainly gone up and I've noticed that because I do have some books that still have price stickers on them that I haven't taken off that I bought you know bought maybe 10 years ago and you can see how the price has gone up and I I see that and I understand that but that doesn't put me off if anything I think it does sometimes make me want to buy a paperback over a hardback because the price can be quite different. That's probably the only thing I really think about. But we always have secondhand books that are always easier on the wallet. And I do want to join the library. I, I have joined the library in theory. I have joined online with my local library. So I want to get up there to see what their hard copy books are like. And we have like a new library being built near us, which is going to be like state of the art. So I'm going to probably jump on that bandwagon. So there are other methods of getting printed books than buying books. One of the reasons I was considering an e-reader initially was because of traveling. And whether it's just traveling during the day or traveling overseas, books are bulky and they take up space. And when I travel, I like to have a selection of books because I am a mood reader. And it can be hard <laughs> trying to take five books with you on holiday. It can be tricky, especially when I, I love the challenge of traveling light. So an e-reader, I see the benefit of it. But what I did last time, I will find the bookshop when I travel. So what I did last time was I took a couple of books with me when I left. And when I finished the books, I then went and bought another book. I limited myself and I bought another book or two from local bookstores. And that was a nice memory to have a book that I bought while on holiday, especially if I buy a book that is related to the location. I think that's really cool. Something else I love with printed books over the other two books is that printed books help children to become better readers. I can't see a child sitting down with an ebook, but a printed book with beautiful illustrations as well as a story, it encourages children to become readers. And it's proven that printed books build better comprehension than digital forms of reading, which I, I do feel as well. I feel like when it comes to digital forms, I do skim a lot more. Printed books can also be shared so easily with people. I feel like there's a warm, there's something a bit warmer to it. I can share a book with anybody whether they have a digital device or not I can share a book with them and for me it's easier to wind down before sleep with a physical book perhaps the most wonderful aspect of printed books is that a home library is one of the most beautiful things in the world I have accepted the challenge of a home library with gusto and I, th I love the idea of really carefully curating that and thinking thoughtfully about what book should be in there it is such a beautiful video Visual of the journey you have taken over your lifetime and I can access it at any time I like. If I buy a book today and put it on my shelf it'll be there in 20 years time for me to pick up and do with what I wish. So considering all of this I have reassessed my habits as a reader and so I wanted to share with you my philosophy of reading going ahead. I'll never say never but I don't think I'll be buying an e-reader anytime soon. First and foremost I want to have ownership over my books. I want to build a library that I can read from anytime I like and read the edition that is exactly the way I bought it. If a book that I have read and that I have bought into my home is ever edited, is ever banned, I want to know that I have a copy in my possession that I can read in its form that the author intended. And for that matter, I want to prioritize getting a copy of books that I think will be challenged or edited or banned in the future. I want to be able to lend books to my friends or give books to my friends. And I want to curl up with a book in the evening. I want less screen time and more page time. When I buy a book, I want to try and buy books locally and from independent booksellers as much as possible. To keep these guys in business because I do not want to be buying books from Amazon online as the only option 50 years in the future, I still want to be able to go into bookstores and experience buying books in person. 
in the future. I want to join my local library and try and experience new authors, new stories without buying them and keep buying books secondhand to reduce the carbon footprint that I may have on this world. I don't want to be closed off from the world when I'm outside so I choose not to put in earphones. I want to be approachable when reading in public. I want people to see what I am reading in public and start conversations with them. You wouldn't believe the conversations I've had with people while I've read in public and wearing headphones would change that. When I go for a walk I want to hear the world around me and be present in that moment. I do not plan on buying audiobooks in the future, but I will take advantage of free books where I can and enjoy them as I like. They are a side dish to my main menu of printed books and I can take them or leave them. So that is my philosophy of reading moving ahead. I would love to hear your thoughts below. I don't know if this is something you guys have thought about at all. Have you thought about how you consume your books? Have you thought about whether the way you consume the books is how you want to consume books 20 years from now. I would love to hear your thoughts below. So please tell me, are you an ebook, audiobook, or a printed book reader? What are your thoughts going ahead? Has any of this information changed how you will read books in the future? Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for watching and I will see you again soon. Bye.